R type of thing. And, and it was like that typical Ellis Island, um, you know, changed it to Corleone type of thing. And it was just Costa with a K. Okay, because I happen to be looking around and here, I think this will work, share screen. I came up with this urban dictionary definition of Costa, what's <laughs> online. <laughs> um, is this, uh, so this explained the change name thing, I, I understand, I guess, so. Adam, for those of you who don't know, Adam's very good at gotcha stuff. He's really <laughs> good. <laughs> All right. It, it works. Just checking that that works. All right. So I will <laughs> stop sharing the screen. So, um, so leave it to you. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, uh, and everybody also, if you have questions and stuff, go to the uh, chat function at the bottom of the screen, and we can um, we can talk about. Uh, you can ask questions. You can do that kind of thing too. Um, Tell me, uh, Dan, like, so you're a Santa Rosa native, right? Yeah, my, my dad is from uh, Healdsburg, so, um, and, and my grandmother I would look, was in Healdsburg also, so I'm kind of that third generation Sonoma County. But yeah, born and raised in Santa Rosa, Santa Rosa High, the whole deal. And so you got into, why, you got into restaurants really early, right? Well, yeah, I mean, I remember one of the stories, I'll try not to make this too long, but when I was a kid, my, my dad and my mom would take me out to these restaurants. And of course, when I was a kid, that was 40 years ago. And uh, so there weren't a lot of good restaurants in town, but there was this one place called The Villa. It's still around. And I was just fascinated when we would go there. I was seven or eight years old, and my, I was just fascinated by the theater of the restaurant and the food and all of that good stuff. And I remember telling my mom, I'm like, you know what, when I grow up, I want to be a busboy. So, so... I set my sights high, and, and that's what I did. Once I got to uh, working age, I actually got a job busing tables at that very restaurant, The Villa, in cool. Santa Rosa. So I worked my way through uh, high school and college in restaurants. And I think where the turning point was when I was busing tables at, when I was 17 years old, up at Chateau Souverain, which is now Coppola. Um, and that was, Gary Danko was the chef there. That was like his first gig. And so I just learned so much from the restaurants. Started drinking wine uh, when I was five with my dad. Um, so it was always like wine and restaurant and food was always part part of life. And when I met you, Adam, I think, what was that, 93, somewhere 90, around there? When I met you and Diana? Actually, is when we did our first tasting. So, and you were a drinker, right. right? I was, and I was, and I ended up being the wine director there uh, yeah. up until about 1999. And um, you know how it is in Sonoma County where, I mean, you were coming in, you were at Benziger, I think. Uh, yeah, right? Right. Bit there, but yeah. we started, Diana and I started Siduri, and we would do just kind of off the bar there, there was a little kind of like cubby areas, and we came in and did tastings for the Siduri group, and we'd bring in these little bottles and, and pour, yeah, and pour what we could for people back then, and I just remember that's, that's where I ended up meeting you for the first time. So yeah, and, and now it's what a great path that was. I mean, we always Michael Brown and I always tell the story about John Ash days because that was it's right in the Russian River Valley, and so we had just a ton of winemakers coming in all the time, and you were getting your start. So we had a ton of people like you and Diana coming in, and and then we just started making wine in uh, in uh, 1997 um, because we just got a half a ton of Pinot Noir fruit from one of the winemakers. And so was Michael working there too? What, what's yeah. Yeah, so he was off and on there as well. Really, we kind of mirrored each other because we he started a couple years after I did, but he also left it around the same time I did as well. And we just did a lot of different jobs at the restaurant. So Michael and I, I think the, the one thing that we really had in common was that we were passionate about, you know, just every part of service, food and wine. And, you know, a lot of times with restaurant employees, they're just kind of getting through college or whatever it is, and it's not going to be a career. But Michael and I were very serious about it at the time. And... If I remember right, you started like with Sauvignon Blanc, actually, right? Yeah, well, actually, the first amateur Pinot Noir we made in 1997, or wine that we made, was Pinot Noir. Okay. Professionally, in 1999, you are correct, we started with Lake County Sauvignon Blanc. Do you remember this? We did a vineyard designate, yeah. Lake County, Romagier Vineyard, uh, for like 11 bucks or whatever. But who does a Lake County vineyard designate Sauvignon Blanc? Oh, no. <laughs> but it, it got us going. It got us off the ground. And so then Pinot, but I mean, you started with Pinot, you said before, like two, a couple of years before commercial. So was, was Pinot always kind of a, a love? Was it just what, 
Yeah, I, I can't, I, I, I can speak for Michael. Yeah, I was because, you know, just at the restaurant, you, you know, back then there were not a lot of great Pinot Noirs around. Right. You know, you could probably count them on two hands other than Burgundy. Um, but, uh, but we found a whole bunch, our Pinot Noir page, maybe I think it was even two pages, which was unheard of back then. So yeah. Michael and I both definitely love it. But I, when I, going back to me starting um, my wine career, was with my dad and he um, he was an airline pilot. So he would bring back all kinds of burgundies. Uh, he was just getting into it. And back then, you know, even like DRCs were affordable back then. So that's that's what I grew up on. So it was always definitely Pinot Noir's number one. And so 97 and I mean, the growth path, uh, obviously Costa Brown or KB as we always just called it, I mean, became like the hot thing along the way, but I mean, there were a number of us that were all involved in that process, um, yeah. kind of growing things. And we all really did like help each other and looked out for each other and, and worked together. It was pretty fun back then. It was, and I hate to say back then because it is a little different now because yeah. there's, there's so much going on. There's so many, uh, um, there's so many people I don't know anything, you know, I mean, I, it's just hard to keep up with all these brands. Um, and people coming from all over to make wine, which I think is, is good, but it's, it's tough. But yeah, like back then it was like, you know, you guys and, and the, the Pisonis and the Francionis were just starting to get going. Yep. Brian Loring, Andrew Vangelo, all of those guys on the Central Coast. And, and that was fun. We did all. You're, you're right. We all had a great exchange of ideas. I do think that there's something that's been lost. When Pinot Noir became very, very popular, there was some uh, thing, something of a commoditization, but also something of a people started worrying about their own growth, their own say, I mean, instead of like, okay, let's, we were all underdogs with Pinot Noir at the time. And we were all trying to just, you know, anything that sold Costa Brown, that would help Siduri. Anything that helped Loring would help Costa Brown. I mean, that kind of thing was great. That, and that was there. I remember going into Mary Edwards, they were not in their current place now, but uh, we walked in and we had just gotten those 98 point scores and spectator and stuff for the 04 vintage. And Mary came out and she just said, Dan, you know, congratulations. That is so good for all of us. And it's true. It's like golfers, you know, they, you got Tiger Woods to thank for your, your salaries, you know, it's because he elevated the game all those many years ago. And, and that's why golf is so popular because of the one guy and that rising tide floats all the boats. And, and that's what it was, Adam, you're, you're spot on about how it was. It was very communal. Uh, the camaraderie was there, um, and, and it, it did get a little bit more competitive, for sure. Yeah. So, regionally, I mean, y'all did spread out some at KB. I mean, you didn't quite do what Diana and I did all the way uh, up to Oregon, necessarily. You never did Oregon, did you? No. You know what we did? I think we did. We used to do, uh, I bet they still might do it at Costa Brown, but we used to do a white and a red that the staff would make. Yeah a barrel of white and a barrel of red. And I think one year they did get some Oregon Pinot. I actually had a bottle of the red not too long ago. So is that right? Yeah. 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 So. They would mix it up every year, whether it was Grenache or Zin or something else, but it was, it was, it was fun. It was good for the staff because basically we were making just Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. So it was good for them to get out of that bubble. So obviously you got to the point that you, you grew enough, grew enough, grew enough, and at some point decided to sell the winery. I mean, I, I'm sure there's lots of stories involved in, in that. Um, what, how ultimately reaching that decision, I mean, Diane and I reached it as well. What, what ultimately yeah. led you to decide to sell? And you, you went through several sales, I guess, before getting Several. There. Yeah. Yeah. And um, it was the first two were, well, they're all, pretty much private equity. But um, the first one was to uh, Bill Price and company, TPG, um, those guys. And that was 09. So 09 was really rough, 08, 09, obviously. Uh, all of our like angel investors, our original investors um, were older. They're like friends and family, including my dad, who at the time was 70 years old and, and the economy was in the shitter. So the value of the brand though was great. Yeah. So, and you know how it is, Diana, you, you know, it's, we sold a lot of wine direct to consumer and that was the key for all of us is that is maintaining a, a certain manageable margin to where you're not selling all of your wine for half off to a, a wholesaler. So our numbers were really good and we just looked at what the company could be worth and we said, you know what, this is good. It's time for a, liquid, a liquidation event because everyone was hurting in their other investments. So uh, it was just time and, and it was good. And we did it typical to form for private equity that lasted five years. And then they sold to John Childs, 
for X amount of money. Michael and I stayed on again. Then Duckhorn bought, uh, bought everything out in 2018, and that's when Michael and I left. So from the early day on, were you, how much winemaking? I mean, you've been a road warrior in a way that I can't even imagine at times. I mean, I just, the amount of time you spent on the road, the sales, the whole thing that you've done. Were you involved in the winemaking early? Not so much? Yeah, a little bit early on. I, I got to be honest with you. I, I wasn't crazy about it. Um, I, I like it. I like doing the winemaking, but um, it was, you know how it is. It's 90% up, set, up, set up and clean up. Yeah. And, and, and that to me was, it was, it was tough. And, you know, I'm starting a family and all of that good stuff, but I did. Yeah, absolutely. I would, I, I was not involved necessarily in the lab. I'm not that guy, but absolutely getting my hands dirty and racking and cleaning barrels and, and harvest, of course, all that stuff. I'm sure that whole thing. Oh yeah. 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 So it's, it it is good. I mean, for, for someone, you, you know, uh, like you and Diana did, um, it basically was a two man operation. Obviously there were other people in there, but for me as managing, being in the face of the company on the road, I need to know the process. I need to know what that vintage felt like, smelled like at harvest. So there, you, you have to get involved, um, even as a marketing person. So, and obviously you, you've gotten back in and we're going to talk in just a second about all of Nolly. And in fact, right now we should talk about this one wine before I drink the whole bottle of it, because it's really this one? the rosé. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, tell me about this wine real quick. I mean, this, so this is the 2019 Audinale Rosé. Yes. Um, yeah. Pinot Noir, 100% Pinot Noir. Okay. <clears throat> you notice the, uh, the color is, is lighter. So, you, you know, it's not a Sonia, um type of uh, process. So you're picking, the grapes, traditional. you're picking the grapes just to make Rosé. Just to make Rosé. Yep. Yeah. So we should be getting pretty close to harvesting this year. Um, obviously, this, though, it's, it's, for those of you not here right now, the weather is, we're in a, a heat spike, but it's just kind of, so we're like, just, we're just wondering if that's going to push us along really fast. It looks like we're going to have 10 days of 100 degree heat out here. So um, we're, we're, we got our eyes on it, but the rosé is certainly the first um, stuff to come in. And we don't, we don't want to, we didn't want to make a, a big full bodied rosé, which certainly like the Southern France type of, rosés that are I, I almost said easy because this is easy but Pinot Noir makes such a complex rosé yeah I think it's fantastic I, I just love the taste of it it's it's and on days like today I mean today didn't get as hot because it got very humid and cloudy and all of that but um it's uh it's a wonderful wine I mean it'd just be fun to be sitting outside and the bottle's gone before you know it so it happens a lot yeah, it happens a lot, and you know, um, it's 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 lower alcohol. It's not up in the fourteen range, but it is definitely a, a wine that before you know it, like you said, if you're sitting in the pool with a Govino, it goes fast. You stainless or oak or? Um, this is all stainless. Okay. okay. Yeah. So talk to me, and I mean, you and I were joking a little bit before this started, um, particularly in the more difficult years. Or, I don't know if this is more difficult, but, you know, you sit there and you worry about the heat and then you have some weird weather, you know, some thunderstorms here or there. And it's like, oh, my God, we sold the winery. We were set. We're good. Why in the hell did we get back into this? <laughs> I mean, and you have to wonder sometimes, like, what what possessed me to start Clarice, Diana to start Flaunt, you to do Alden Holly? Why? What? Well, I think I think um, there are several reasons. One is it's the only thing I know what to do or how to do. I just that's I've spent the last twenty three years doing it, so it's just I, I didn't I don't necessarily want to change. However, we've learned so much, and when you get you get casted into your own brand, whether it's Suduri or Novi or Costa Brown, where the brand is much bigger than you, right? They're much bigger than an individual. And, and there's kind of a, um, there is a, uh, a culture about a brand and, and to, to go out and apply what you've learned to, with a different project, I think that's the main driver for, for me. Um, and, to, and to explore a little bit more, because that's what, you know, well, that's what wine is, is there's, there is no perfection. It's just a pursuit, right? And so that, that part of the passion doesn't change, but the business side, that, it's tough, say That's man. what life is, Dan. I mean, it's yeah. not just wine, but that's what life is, is learning, taking what you learned and kind of growing from there and, and pursuing something. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So 
Uh, so it has been fun. And, and for us, um, it is finding more cooler climate, no matter what varietal we're, we're making, whether it's Zin, you know, our Zinfandel is Russian River, our Pinot Noirs are pretty much Sonoma Coast, we are going to introduce a Russian River, but it's cooler sites, you know, and then the uh, the Chardonnay in Santa Barbara is a, is a pretty cool site too. So, so how did Auden Ali come about? I mean, how, how, how much longer did you have non-compete for a little bit? How, what was yeah. the whole process? Well, that's, that's why we're sitting here, like just in the last two years, being able to talk about this. And that's why, I mean, we've been making wine since 2013 and not a lot of people know because due to my non-compete, I couldn't really get out there and, and uh, proactively market. I could do little dinners, you know, but I, we could make up to a certain amount of wine every year, which was like a thousand cases. And, uh, but then when I left Duckhorn, we, that non-compete went away. So here we are. So anyway, it, we were, we were happy enough to have the brand. Um, this is a project between us, the Costas and the Legacy family. So Emerald and Alden Legacy. And we started making wine in 2013 while I was at Costa Brown. And of course it is very, was very limited back then. It still is, but uh, now we can get out and talk about it. And um, Alden is an alley are the, are the wives. Um, and that's where the name came from. We couldn't call it Dan and Emerald. Um, so, um, and the Legacies, um, they, they live out in uh, Destin, Florida. So they're, they're out here as much as possible, but I'm definitely the boots on the ground out here. How, coming up with the name, did it take a little bit? I mean, because it wasn't a real word, so to speak, or whatever. I mean, y'all did. Well, it's so hard to find a real word now. It for, is. You know, trademark yeah. stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that's what, how Costa Brown came about. It was just like, well, screw this. Let's just put our name on it because, we, you know, everything is taken. Mm -hmm. Or it sounds like a Oldsmobile or whatever it was. I think our first name was Altera. And Michael says, nah, that sounds like a Buick. So, so we, just, we just slapped our names on it. And then we had the same kind of theory with Alden Alley. So. No, I mean, I and I think it works, and I actually I love the the design with the A's and red and all of that. I mean, it's it's pretty cool. You had somebody design it for you, or yeah, yeah, a friend of mine, um, uh, Tim Martin over in Napa, he did it for us. Um, he's in the wine; he's got his own wine stuff too. But if you feel the, uh, have you felt the uh, a bottle of the Pinot? Uh, the D and the the D and the E are embossed for for Dan and Emerald. Yeah, okay. So there's a little there's little Easter eggs on there. Cool. No. Uh, I hadn't felt the bottle of, I don't really usually find myself. You like feeling things. Yeah, rubbing up and down on a bottle of pina <laughs> necessarily, but could happen on a Friday night, maybe, something like that. Um, what, uh, so tell us about the lineup then of, of the wines you've got. So you've got the rosé, you mentioned a Santa Barbara Chardonnay. What led to that? You did? You, well, you mentioned a Santa Barbara Chardonnay. How did that... How did you, that? You come? did. You called me and said, "Hey, these guys. Uh, th there's some Sierra Madre fruit available." You I did. Actually, I said, yeah, that's true. yeah, that was right. that's your deal. Okay. And um, I we think that this is all clone four now. So it was. Um, I believe we had some uh, Wente clone in there before. We, this is our third vintage of Chardonnay. So it really, it really is good for a crisp. There's no ML on the wine. Okay. Um, neutral oak. And, but it's still, it doesn't really have the, it doesn't, to me, you know how you get like a, a stainless zero ML Chardonnay and it just like stains you yeah. a little bit. This, I don't think this is like this. This still has a richness to it. Not a creaminess by any means, but it, it's got that clean minerality too without going over the top with just huge, huge acids, you know? So you got us started with that. It, it's gone crazy. Chardonnay is still unbelievable as far as sales. It's just Isn't everyone it, drinks I mean, Chardonnay. It's pretty wild. Chardonnay flies still for so many people. Yeah, it does. It does. And uh, so we're happy about that. Obviously, the, our brand it does revolve around Pinot Noir. And um, Sonoma Coast, we're leasing the Campbell Ranch out in uh, Annapolis. Okay, so you've got a Sonoma Coast, a uh, Campbell Ranch, and Sun Chase that I know of, at least. But So Campbell yes. is what I've got here to try in a minute. So Yeah, yeah. And the, so the Campbell's way out with true Sonoma Coast. Mm -hmm. uh, and, then, um, and then Sun Chase is Petaluma Gap. Okay. So farther south. And you mentioned you've got a Russian River coming up at some point in time too. We have a Russian River, just a blend, and uh, and then we have the Zinfandel. Okay. And the yeah. Zin comes from a good friend of ours, uh, Jake Bilbro, his Limerick yeah. Plain. 
Yeah, it's kind of my pet project. We make about a hundred cases a year. It's it's nothing. You've you've worked with uh, that fruit. Yep. Um, yep. And uh, I'm I love that fruit. I've always loved that fruit, even before Jake owned the winery. Going back to the '80s, it just it really is a unique site, and <clears throat> it's got a it's got a flavor profile that you can pull out of a lineup, no problem. So um, Jake allowed us, starting in 2015, to peel off uh, two tons a year out of there. And it's, it's, it's great. It's, you know, it's that head prune stuff, which <clears throat> you and I have talked about this. Man, Zinfandel is, is uh, easy to, to gauge as far as the head, head prune stuff. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's such an uneven ripening um, grape out there. So you kind of have to go with your gut. And, you know, you could do some accurate sugars, I suppose. But, man, it... It's, it's rarely what you think it is. So for me, like winemaking with Pinot Noir, you know, in a hot year, maybe where there's stuff that's been raising a little bit, you pick it and you say it's 24 and it ends up soaking up to 25 or 25.5. You have a point, point and a half. Zen is a point and a half within like 12 hours and it's four points before you know it. And yeah. uh, if you pick at 24, you end up at 28, Ricks. And, um, and then you got to deal with, you know, potentially 16% alcohol is in and trying to get it dry kind of thing. So, yeah, exactly. We err, we definitely err on the lower side. Um, we, we, we usually end up at around a 14% uh, alcohol on those. So on that uh, line, and you were talking about you earlier, I mean, you involved in the winemaking, but weren't the winemaker at, at KB and all that. You've got a winemaker, a guy that we both know well, Shane. Um, yeah. Pretty I'm sure a lot of people here know Shane too. Yeah. Um, so Shane was the winemaker at Costa Brown from 06 to 2012. I, I, I think his first vintage at Linmar was 2012. So, um, so that's when he went over to Linmar for a few years. Uh, and then he went out on his own. He's always had his own brand, Shane. Yep. And, uh, really, but then really he really wanted to change yeah. stuff. And, really yeah. And Diane, it's like what you guys did with Novi, right? I mean, more right. of a, there's some more uh, Rome stuff in there. And yeah. Um, in fact, he, he really got away from Pinot Noir. He's, he's done, did a good job of focusing, not away from Pinot Noir, but his Rhone stuff is just fantastic. So, um, but yeah, so he, uh, so we hooked up again in 2013. He was wanting to become a little bit more independent, which means, you know, consulting. And so um, our project allows him to be flexible. And, um, and he's got another project called 37 that he works with. Um, and it's all under the same roof. And so it's, it's pretty cool. And Shane's just a really good guy, hard worker, great palate, and he's a technician. I should probably have him on here at some point in time. You, you probably should. Yeah. Yeah. You're uh, turning how, into like a Jimmy Fallon here. Yeah. I like doing this kind of thing. I think it's fun. <laughs> I've actually had like two people approach me recently and say, Hey, can we get on? So, uh, you know, maybe there's a, a lineup at some point in time waiting for this. Yeah. Yeah, uh, well, I would think so, but um, you, so, you've got you've done so much work to, to to develop a network over the last twenty five years. It's crazy. You are you're nonstop. So Sun Chase is Petaluma Gap. You said so. You've got a Pinot from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And um, Petaluma Gap is an area that people don't know as much about. I mean, it's a recent AVA in some ways. Yeah, and you know what? We we haven't really used the AVA. I'm sure to uh, the displeasure of the new association. Yeah, probably. But, um, I, I'm on the fence about it because, you know, you want to put Sonoma Coast on there. So do you want Petaluma Gap, Sonoma Coast, Sonoma County, yada, yada. Where uh, Petaluma Gap, I think that they just, they work very hard to uh, promote, uh, but it's, it is definitely a lesser known appellation. For those that don't know, it was just previously just incorporated into this huge, huge default of Sonoma Coast. Uh, and now Sonoma Coast is getting carved up accurately so, in my opinion. But Petaluma Gap, it's, a, it's an interesting name, first of all, you know. So, uh, but it, it's definitely a, um, a uh, distinctive area, um, lower, more coastal, um, sometimes even more than true Sonoma Coast, more, more fog and wind. Yeah, I mean, True Sonoma Coast is an interesting area simply because some areas can be higher up, some areas can be lower, you can be above the fog, you can be, I mean, there's just a lot of differences yeah. in one area. That's why, I guess, Fort Ross Seaview has become its own area also in some ways, so. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, but it's, the, 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 go, go ahead. Well, where's Campbell exactly then, too? I mean, the so Campbell, I'm sitting here in Healdsburg. I would drive north west 
uh, past Lake Sonoma and go out Skag Springs Road. Um, so it's on the way to Sea Ranch. So it's only a few miles from Sea Ranch, which is almost to the Mendocino, like Point Arena almost. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so uh, it, as the crow flies, it's not that far, but man, it's a long drive. Because it's through all those hills out there, you know. Windy drive, the whole, yeah, that's. Yeah, that's, yeah. Cool. I would not want to be the truck driver that delivers our grapes, I tell yeah. you. That. What, um, is it high up somewhat or? Yeah, so it's about a thousand feet. Okay. And so, yeah. above which is not fog. that high up, but it does poke up above the fog quite, a, you know, right. a little bit. It's right there, right there at that line. And how big is it? I mean, what? Uh, let's see. Our we don't lease the whole thing. Okay. Um, so you know, uh, we but we have certainly grown our holdings there. Uh, I think that we get close to let's see here, uh, close over ten acres. Okay. That, yeah, that's a good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's just it's just hard. It was it was previously farmed by uh, Ulysses out Valdez yeah. before he passed. So that's uh, Ulysses. Uh, he got us access. Our good friend John Holdridge had fruit from out there. Pay Ant Hill, Papa Pietro Perry. Um, and so with that particular wine, I mean that's I guess kind of a flagship. If you have one, I don't know. I mean it really, but I mean ten acres is a. Uh, that would have been big back in the early KB days. That would have been big in the Sidiri days. I mean, to get 10 acres from one place would have been a lot. Of I know, I know exactly. Right. So um, we definitely are putting a lot of eggs into that basket. And uh, we started doing a vineyard designate from there in 2015 after working with it for a couple of years. And then uh, we just uh, decided to uh, go into partnership with Steve Campbell and lease it, lease our blocks. Sure. from him starting last year and, and it, it really is good fruit it's unique i'm not sure if you've opened it or if you've yeah no no it. i'm drinking it right now it's pretty tasty um it's kind of interesting because if you put up if you put the cam like a lot of times if you have a single vineyard wine and you put it next to its cousin which is a, maybe a larger appalachian wine so in our case the sonoma coast versus the campbell ranch a lot of times the single vineyard wines are a little bit more i don't know why but a lot of times winemakers make them with more intensity um, maybe it's just trying to get more expression out of, of the wine. Our, our Sonoma Coast is actually weightier than the Campbell. The Campbell does not want to be a heavy wine. Mm -hmm. It has savory notes to it. Um, there's a mix of red and black fruit, all kinds of um, um, Dijon clones in it mainly. So, um, but it has a little bit of uh, that um, uh, savory notes to it and almost like a little pine needle um, pithiness to it as well. So. Um, which is good. It's because it's not that easy, generous fruit. There's, there, it's, it's a little bit more cerebral, I think. I know Diane and I found that in Santa Rita Hills for a different reason, but sometimes, um, particularly with younger vineyards down there, the stuff was very tannic. Um, and so um, the heavier weighted wine oftentimes was our Santa Rita Hills blend and the wine that was a little lighter or more approachable in some ways or just wasn't too tannic and had more complexity was things like the clopepi or i mean it was kind of the opposite of what most of the places we dealt with in Siduri was like and probably most of the places with kb too back in the day so yeah yeah obviously you know back back in the day the cost of brown wines were pretty intense and 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 the single vineyard wines typically were a little bit more intense yeah. um, you, for whatever reason so when, when you start Alden Ollie, do you say, I want it to, so, I mean, I know you've got some Clarice wine there too, and we don't need to talk that much about that, but you can feel free to drink some Clarice wine there as well. Um, but do you say, I want to be different than at all than, than what I was before? I mean, is that? It's a, it's a great question. Um, and, it's, and it's a good question because I, did, I didn't have the answer to that. What I didn't want to do was um, Costa Brown, redo you know mm -hmm. um i definitely wanted to get out of the safety zone a little bit more um but at, at the end of the day what you have to do is follow your palate right and and my palate has evolved everyone palates evolve i think uh, but you, you have to be honest with yourself and you can't force an issue so to say well i don't want to be costa brown Okay, well that's great. You don't run from something, run to something. Yep. And and so that's what we had to define what we were running to. And and for me it was more the cooler climate, um, 
a little bit more intellectualism in the wine as far as complexity exploration, like I keep saying. Um, but, you know, a lot of people would say, oh, yeah, let's make a delicious beverage. Well, I want to make, I want to do something more than a delicious beverage. I want to have, I want to have people think, I want to have mark the time or an occasion or a friendship or whatever without it. I, I almost want it to be, yeah, start out in the background, but I would really like in the middle of a conversation for people to go, what is that? Yeah. You know, that, you know, and, and actually have it be part of a, of a conversation and, and a representation of where people are in their lives. I, I jokingly say that I'm doing it backwards in some ways sometimes because like with Clarice, I'm making wines that I think sometimes are going to benefit from age while I think the Siduri stuff at the time. And part of that is, was real younger vine issues too, or, or challenges. When you started in at KB in 97, when I started Siduri with Diana in, in 94, a bunch of the stuff was like, we just had brand new Pinot vines. I mean, Pinot was kind of a new thing and there was a lot of new plantings. And years and years ago, Tom Rocchioli told me with Pinot, with young vines, it, what you can't get in complexity, make up for it with pick it riper and just make up for it with bigger, richer fruit. And I'm like, okay, that makes some sense. We don't have as many young vines anymore. I mean, there's some Pinot plantings out there that they've been around for a while now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, the, the youngest stuff, I mean, or the oldest stuff that we worked with was the Cone Vineyard. And that, I think the Cone is now, geez, 50 years old or older. Yeah. But that's by far like one of the oldest um, Pinot Noir vineyards around. You know, most of the stuff that we were working with, I mean, geez, we had to go out and find stuff. I mean, how old was Kiefer when you started working with that? Or yeah, and for that us, was, like, Kanzler yeah. was new. Copeland was brand new. They were all brand new. Gary's, I've been, I mean, Diane and I made that from the very first vintage. Rosella's the very first vintage. Clopepe, the very first vintage. I mean, on and on and on again, it was like, okay, these were brand new places. And, um, and so in those wines, you just made big, rich effusively fruity and damn they were tasty i mean these were really enjoyable wines and as you said a delicious beverage now it's kind of take the next step the vineyards are giving you the opportunity to take that step and then whether you can choose to do that or not in some ways that's right that's right and it's 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 been a very interesting evolution and, and during we the, the process of making those wines whether it's you guys or loring or costa brown um, we were making some pretty big voluptuous wines and that defined that time of the, the, the mid 2000s. Yeah. And, and it, what's interesting about that is it was relatively accidental in some cases. Um, and we got classified. We kind of got typecasted, right? Yeah. And, um, and so that's, that's kind of the, the biggest challenge is to, to get the message out that, Hey, it's okay. We evolved. There was nothing wrong with those wines that we made, but you know, it's like they were blockbusters, and and that's cool. It kind of shook the California industry a little bit, which is good. It needed it, but the pendulum always comes back to the middle, right? Yeah, I, I actually think people don't talk about this enough, but the timing of Sideways, which was uh, came out at the end of two thousand four, so the two hottest vintages that I ever dealt with were two thousand three and two thousand four. So. Yes. Uh, the wines were extremely big just based on what the year was. They were high alcohol, they were, and um, so Sideways comes out where all of us were kind of releasing our 2003s at that time. And there's a whole new audience of people that are tasting these wines. And they are like, this is what Pinot's supposed to be, right? And all of that. And so a lot of us started following that kind of down the rabbit hole. I'm not trying to say we made wine just for others. I mean, I'm not trying to be, but, but we got the reviews too. Yes. Yeah. You know, for that style and for better or for worse, but right. we, you know, it was, it was successful basically. It was, I look at 2005 as a, a, a potentially screw up year for, for me. I'm not talking about you, but 2005 was a cooler vintage and, um, I don't think we went too far, but I do think it's the, okay, three and four led you down this path. Five didn't. The vintage didn't. I mean, it wasn't. And so you started to sit there and say, here's the success of Pinot and the style that's currently really in vogue. Here's what the vintage is giving you. And they're two different divergent paths. And you got to choose one or the other and trying to push it down the wrong direction. It, it, 
it's not the right thing to do ultimately. Yeah, no, it's not. But you, but but you grow. I mean, we. Oh yeah. How young were we in 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 the two thousands, the early two thousands? You know, and not age young, but but like just experience in winemaking. You only make wine once a year. You do right. So it's so it's it's this evolution, and so I always just just ask people. I said you have to be patient with winemaking. It's like it's not like a speedboat; it's an aircraft carrier, and it takes a long time to steer those whatever um, uh, again culture or beliefs or values in winemaking. It's going to evolve, but it's going to evolve. It's not going to be a revolution, rarely. Yeah. No, and it takes a, a period of time. It takes patience. It takes the understanding that sometimes the best vintages are the ones where you grow more as a winemaker. You don't always make the best wines, but you learn more about what you're doing and that moves you ahead more yeah. importantly than just making one better wine that particular year. So, so I, so I'm drinking Clarice right now, yes. in particular, the Rosellas. I, I want to hear more about it because Rosellas is a vineyard that we all, we all have a great deal of experience with, but uh, one of the reasons that it's such a popular vineyard, I think, is its uniqueness. I was talking about that, like with Limerick Lane Zinfandel. Yep. Um, Rosellas, I don't know how many people are making Rosellas now, 15, 20? Yeah, yeah but, I think actually it's down to like 12 now. I mean, I think he got it? up like 15 and then cut it back by somebody's not paying him eventually or something like that. So. Right. But this is so Rosellas. Yeah. Um, tell me about how you capture that. So what... Uh, First off, it's part of what you're talking about with Campbell, and I have the Rosellas here actually myself. Part of what you're talking about with Campbell is kind of what Diana and I always did with Siduri, what um, I do with Gary, which it's not the least, I don't think, in exactly the same way you're talking about, but it is, I have complete and total per acre sections. I mean, so I am paying this price per acre no matter what I get from it. And then I get to be involved in that. And you know Gary Francioni well, and, and they're going to farm stuff fantastic there. So it's not like I am asking them to do anything that's necessarily going to increase the quality, but it's going to increase the uniqueness of what I'm done. I'm sure out of Campbell. I mean, Ann Hill gets some other sections or other people do, you know, the guy's a good farmer or the farming is good. The farm, But you're saying this is what we're doing that makes it unique to Alden Alley. Um, I'm trying to do things unique to Rosella. So one of the things I'm doing is I'm taking two very different sections in the vineyard that ripen usually 10 days apart or so. And I am sampling them together and picking them together as if they were one section. It's the way my grandmother Clarice taught me to cook, which was in a crock pot at the time. And she said, you put the meat, the potatoes, the carrots, the, the seasoning, the broth, all in at once, it all melds together. You add something later, it stands out. So I'm definitely following something of a different path there. And I'm doing a lot of whole cluster on this. This is- this I, I definitely is, got that. What's your percentage on that, on this one? Uh, in 18, it's 80% whole cluster. See, but the thing is, so I don't like, whole cluster that really sticks out because I think it takes over, not, not that it tastes like a bell pepper, but it's the equivalent of a bell pepper on a pizza, right? That's yeah. all you taste. But this is in such good balance. I would have guessed less than 50%. So what happened was, it's real interesting, 17 vintage is like 55%, but it was a hot year. And I think the 17s taste more like whole cluster than the 18s do because I think getting ripe stems has to do with how long it hangs on the vine. So in a hotter year, like this year, I'm trying to debate what to do because um, it's been a warmer vintage. So, um, or now it is. I'm not saying but it's it going to go fast though too, right? It could From go very, out. very quickly. So you have to make some decisions there as to what you do and what you don't do at that point in time. Um, it's, uh, it's an interesting balance and it's one of those things that you hopefully don't make wine by I think this is the worst sin. Make wine by a, a formula every year. You can't do that. Each year has its own challenges, it's its own things. I was talking to Mitch Frank, who you know well from time in New Orleans, um, from the yep. Wine Spectator. I was talking to Mitch today, and he was like, have you had another vintage like this particular one? And I'm like, no. <laughs> I really actually, this one I, doesn't remind me of anything else right now. 
It's yeah, it's it's interesting. I just poured the Gary's yep. after that, and it's so and again, and that's typical too. I mean, the juxtaposition the Gary's is typically darker, a little yep. more. It spreads it's out more, a little bit more. Like, more like, Rosella's is more laser laser focused, you know. Yeah. Um, love them, and and you don't. It doesn't seem to me that you use as much whole cluster on the Gary's. Uh, it's close. It's is about it close. Yeah. But the thing there is the fruit is more. Um, I don't know. It shows more. The interesting thing there is I think the Gary's is going to show better early, but it also ages longer. It's one of those weird wines, you know, that occasionally you have just absolute balance in a wine and you're like, what's this shows incredibly well early, but it's going to show well for the rest of its life in some ways. So I, I think that's, um, that's kind of fun. So with all the all knowledge stuff you've done now, I mean, 2013, not a lot of people know. I mean, as you said, you had to kind of be quiet about it for a while and all that. What, um, uh, with that, do you have any wines that have really stood out in your mind? Because, I mean, we all do a, a, every now and then. I and mean, we don't like to admit what our favorite kids are, but we all have them <laughs> at some point. Yeah, my middle, my middle is by far my favorite. There you go. <laughs> so. No, uh, no, you're right. But but you, there's just different qualities. And I think that the way you phrase it is, is a good way to phrase it. It's like what stands out. Sometimes boring is good because it's safe, right? But... I always like the, at least with Costa Brown, we don't have a ton of history with, with all the alley, but at least with Costa Brown, I was always fascinated by the off vintages because you, you paid attention a little bit more. Um, and so I, I think that that's kind of what we, we find. Of course, we've, we've had a pretty good string of vintages here in the last yeah. um, while. Um, I thought the most intriguing one, and, and it's not because of the style, style or quality, it's, I thought spoke of the vintage the most was, were the 15s. Okay. Um, because, you know, we're coming, that was kind of wrapping up drought. Of course, we're in like a perpetual state of drought now, but, um, and, and it was such a low crop yield that the flavors were just so concentrated. So our 15s, not to compare to the old days, but it, it kind of resembled what you and I are talking about, a little bit more hedonistic, you know, nothing crazy over the edge, but it was something that it was just, Wow, especially Campbell Ranch, where you, it's hard to get out there and and um, and and make a call within 24 hours of picking, you know. So um, it just was a little more concentrated. But I tell you what, the old Cost of Round fans love that. They love that 15. So tell me about like sales right now, just too in general. And I mean, this can kind of get insider baseball in some ways and all that, but. I mean, you know, and you've always had that finger on the market. You know what it's like, you know, this or that. What um, we're dealing with, in my mind, at least, an unprecedented time. And we've gone through recessions before. We've done this, all of that. We've not had restaurants shut down. We've not had um, things like that. For, I mean, first off, I guess, how's Emerald doing? What are they doing? How is that happening? And then secondly, what do you see out in the, the market for wine right now? Well, I mean, the good news is <clears throat> people don't stop drinking. They might right. even drink a little bit more. So it's just a matter of, okay, where do you get it, right? So, yeah, these restaurants, it's really painful to see. I mean, you know, Emerald, New Orleans is a hot spot. So all of those restaurants are closed. Thomas Keller just closed two restaurants in New York, right? So if it's happening to guys like Thomas Keller, then you know it's a widespread problem. Of course, we knew it was a widespread issue anyway. So, but what we've attempted to do is be very transparent where it's like, okay, we released some wine and we kind of, excuse me, sold out. Well, we had all these wines allocated for restaurants that are now back on our cellar. So we kind of are doing these re-release things and which is okay, it's, I, th I think it's fine. The only challenge now is shipping, of course, because it's yeah. so hot. So we're gonna have to wait probably yeah, but a little while. Wait a couple of months, they're not, I mean, I don't think anybody here online, I mean, they're here because they like wine or they love wine. They're into this and all that. They'll be like, wait till October, November, or whatever you think is. Yeah. And, and I will tell you this though, again, to be transparent, I, we've halted growth this year. We didn't bring on new contracts for growth. Um, it's just not a good year to do that. So I think that you're going to find that um, the market's going to be pretty soft uh, in the next two years, as far as sales go. I mean, I, I you know, we've, there's going to be deals out there. Wine's going to, I, I think wine's going to, it's almost like a correction. Almost. 
It is. The, the thing I worry about or wonder about, I remember some years ago in the Loire, in Muscadet, they were, um, the they, French government bought the wine back from the producers and made fuel out of it. But people were, at the time, like, uh, the distributors were like, you, I can't believe you can get this wine and it retails for nine bucks. It retails for nine, blah, blah, blah. The problem yeah. with that is the winery goes out of business at that price. I mean, yes, you can take advantage of it right now and that's cool and yeah, it's great wine to drink, but the winery does not live at that price point anymore. And for us, the, the land prices are not coming down. No. You know, and that's the driver, right? Um, you know, prices are going up and up and up and therefore your tonnage goes, your ton price goes up and it's just a, a, it's a cycle. So we're gonna just have to find better ways of, of getting back to normal. $56, which is our price for our Sonoma Coast Pinot Noir, that's, that's expensive. But to sell it for anything less than, like you said, we're going out of business. Yeah, no, you, you are. You're not going to make it, and people need to be understanding long-term health, but we need to adjust our quantities. Like you said, this is a year where you're not going to grow. Philippe can be. I've got this new project, uh, Beaumarche, with Philippe. Right. Uh, that I'm doing, and we're gonna be bottling on August 26th, which is fun, because it's Clarice's birthday, it's also Diana's birthday. So, um, uh, but it's funny that my grandmother and Diana both had the same birthdays, but uh, we had a lot of weird birthday coincidences uh, <laughs> in the family. Her mom and our son had the same birthday as well. Um, Diana comes from a big family, so maybe that yeah. makes the, the opportunities to have. The odds are, the odds are good. <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly. But uh, I think that these, uh, the, the thing with Philippe this year, he was like, should we grow? And I'm like, no, I don't think so. This is not the year to consider growing right now. We need to like kind of hang and make sure we do what we do kind of thing. Yeah, I, I think so. And it, it'll be interesting. You know, here's the other thing, too, is you have so many of these wineries that are allocated. You know, I, I, that, that whole ethos is, is kind of going away as well. Well, you made it during the, the, and we made it as well, both, during the critic means everything days. Right, right, right. So it, it's a totally different world now. It's a, it's a totally different world. A 95 doesn't, it's not going to, and Spectator, a 94 is not going to move the needle. No. Maybe a 95. Yeah. But, you know, it just doesn't matter anymore. Uh, there's just, there's too many opinions. And I, I don't know, I think it's, I think that we rode that train pretty well, but I think we're better off with more voices. Did, um, so a couple people are asking, and I, and I think you, you have uh, someone that works here that may answer this, but People can buy wine from you right now, but can they just request that you hold shipping till it's cooler? Kind yeah. of thing? I'm sure yeah. it's yeah. going to be an issue. So Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, we're, we, it's an overused word, but we pivoted yeah. and, and it's just, we have wine, you know, I mean, that's good. Like we talked about it off air, but you know, the Chardonnay and Rosé, we're on the 19 and it's going to sell out fast. So some wines we, have sometimes there's some wines we you know they go faster so it's not it's not allocated that's fine because you know half of our wine was going to restaurants half of it let, let me ask you on, on rosé real quick just the market is popular it's incredibly popular but also i know some people this year had some issues with bottling rosé quickly on time because of covid stuff and all of that and so um I always, in years past, used to say you don't ever want to overproduce rosé because it's got like this short window that people are going to drink it. I think that's changed a bit. People are drinking rosé in different, I mean, longer periods of the year than ever before. Is, do you find that too? You mean, you mean year round? Uh, year round or close. Absolutely. To yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I don't think it, look, there's a progression of an evening. I don't care if it's the 4th of July or Christmas. You know, I want a white or a, or a rosé early on in the evening at Christmas or, or, or you know, at day drinking, you know, if you that's, it's always appropriate, somebody more appropriate posted, for that. Somebody just posted and they're completely right. Sorry to interrupt you, but it's completely right. Thanksgiving meal and rosé. Oh, it's yes. like, that's ideal. 
Yeah, exactly. I it just it, to me, it's just not just a beach wine. Right. It, it's just like anything else. It, it has a, a time and a place, and it's, it's of course it's year round. I drink it year round at least. Yeah, no, just, but but we didn't used to do that. No, no, because I think that um, I I don't think we were uh, most people were serious about rosé. And so it was an occasion wine, you know, like, like maybe how people drink sangria or something like that. But now the rosé is a lot more serious and, and, um, and it is more part of a everyday type of thing. Do you, it's interesting because I, I often wonder how to build more complexity in rosé, but I don't know that people really care about that necessarily. I mean, is there a, a way to do that or is it even important? <clears throat> I, I don't, I, I like the elegance of a rosé. I'm, I'm a stickler when it comes to sugar. I'm, I'm, I don't like yeah. uh, it much, a, a residual sugar in a rosé. So that's, but you're, you're right. You, you do struggle to do it. But you know what, with this rosé, I'll, I'll tell you right now, we added a, about 2% of still wine or of uh, Pinot Noir, regular Pinot Noir. Okay. Yeah. I, I, mean, I could honestly drink the rosé all, I mean, day and night and all that. It's... it's Especially this week. Well, you yeah. know, I, I think it does have a place all year round, but it does especially have a place in, in the hot weather. Yeah. Especially while you're driving, you know, it's, you got a screw cap on it. So, yeah, you did screw caps. So I've got screw caps on the, the upper end stuff. You decided to do it on the lower end stuff. You just... Uh, hmm. Lower end, excuse me? Well, I don't Those are know. lower end stuff. Oh, what's the price point? What do I, you're not doing it on, I don't see it on the Campbell Ranch here. Chard, no, Chardonnay is 38, the, the uh, Rosé is 26. But I always said, and, and you and I kind of diverge on this, and, and maybe I'm wrong, but no, I, it just, fine. it's my fine. gut thing is that anything that's meant to be consumed like this year, screw cap, screw cap. Right. I, I agree. I still like the way our Pinot's age under cork. And, and yeah, there is a failure rate. I'm not sure exactly what it is. I'm probably guessing it's at or around 1%. It's gotten, but, it's gotten much better, honestly. Yeah. It has. But I, I believe it's gotten much better because of screw caps to some extent. I think competition has helped. We should never. No doubt. Yeah. Exactly. No, I, I think it is great. Uh, and, the, and then you have like the DM stuff, which is everyone's raving about it. I haven't used them. I'm, I'm, I've played with it on a couple of wines at now and, um, yeah, I think it's interesting too. So, um, I, yeah. I think this idea that we should only have one way of sealing a wine hmm, is stupid. No, I, I totally agree with that. And I have no problem, you know, opening up a Clarice with a screw cap or, or being at a restaurant and spending 150 bucks on a bottle of wine and it has a screw cap. It doesn't bother me at all. No, um, I just personally like the way our wines age under cork. That's no, it's it's all cool. I think there are different ways also of making wine. I've often told people I don't make a big sulfur addition right at the very end because I think then you do that and you add screw cap to it. It captures it in it. You don't do that. I do. Yeah, this is a little more a little more uh, uh, um, anaerobic. Yes, yes, it is. So. I think that's a, a an interesting dynamic it, it, that if you have a certain way of making wine, you may not want to use screw cap. If you have a certain yeah. way of making wine, you may not want to use cork. It can go all or, or diem or whatever. You, you can you can adjust that based on certain things. So, do you think people drink more wine if they just subconsciously if they go to the wine cellar and it's easier? Do you think people would drink more wine because of a screw cap? Barbara at uh, JFW has told me before, she's like, I open a lot of Siduri because it's just easy. Yeah, it's simple. So yeah. I don't know, but that's an interesting question. I have no well, it's kind of Well, it's kind of like that stat. What is it? 90% of the wine consumed was purchased in the last 24 hours. Yeah. So it's, it's people do want convenience for sure. So my, they're not always just planning a meal with, uh, with, a, with a, you know, an Opus One. Dan, I have never come up with more ideas along the way that have not been come to fruition than with you. You and I have drunk, I mean, we got drunk so many times, come up with brilliant ideas, half of which I forgot, but the other half of which it just hasn't quite worked out or this or that. I mean, we've always played with these things, uh, been tempted with ideas, that kind of thing. I, I think that there is something out there as far as, let's come up with um, 
a, a wine together and do something that's fun. You do it under screw cap, you do it under this, you know, more people I know right now want to make an inexpensive, reasonably priced Pinot Noir to expand the market again, to open it up, to, to, to do that. Jake Bilbrow wants to do it with Zen. He loves, or, or wines. He believes that it's important to have more people drinking more good wine again. And just no doubt. To explore that. Yeah, I mean, we, we focus so much on competition within our industry, but really the competition's outside of the industry or outside of the wine industry with beer and spirits. Right? And it, that's that's where we want to have more people drinking, not getting them to change from, you know, Chardonnay to Cabernet. It's getting them to change from a martini to any glass of wine. Yeah, and, and I think beer is is kind of failing a little bit with fitness and with all that, but spirits, they're it's huge. We don't have a good way. So you and I can go to a bar and we can order, let's have a taste of this spirit. Let's have one little taste of that. By the glass, wine is limited in price point in some ways. And so the idea that they are going to do a Campbell Ranch by the glass, pretty slim. It's not, people don't have an opportunity to try this wine, which is fantastic, and, and try it and say, it's worth the extra 10 bucks for a glass kind of thing. Well, I always said, even when I was a wine director, and, and I think the, the, um, the conventional wisdom was that, well, wine by the glass is good because people don't want to spend a whole bunch of money. And I'm like, no, that's not what it's good for. It's good because you only get one glass of, and you get to try a really nice bottle without having to commit to uh, the whole bottle, whether you want a bottle of white and a bottle of red or whatever, you can mix and match. People aren't cheap about wine by the glass. They just want access to wines. They, you know, they don't want the whole bottle because they're driving or whatever it is. You ever played with half bottles? I mean, I, I, we did at one point in time, but not as much perhaps as we should have. We did. Um, I'm, not, I'm not totally sure about the popularity of them now because there's so many preservation methods, whether it's a Coravin or, you know, all of that Coravin other stuff. It's a cool thing. I mean, it's a cool idea. Yeah. I'm not sure once the bottle gets too low, I'm not sure it completely works, but I, I love the idea. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I don't even own one because I finished the you bottle. You don't have a bottle that goes <laughs> your house. Come on, Dan. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but we did we did have bottles at Costa Brown, but we only had them for restaurants. And we got a bunch of complaints from our mailing list customers because they wanted them at home. So, uh, but you know how it is. I mean, it's virtually the same amount. Uh, the packaging is the same amount as the seven fifty. So they are expensive. They are no, they they cost more than half of the price, no doubt. Because you're right, the the cork is about the same. It's it's you know a buck for a high-end cork and 78 cents or 80 cents for a shorter, I mean, it's still a high-end, but a shorter cork. The glass is uh, like 80% of the cost. I mean, the whole thing, it's just over and over and over again, the costs are, are close to as high. And, and, here, and here's the other thing too, just as far as inventory management, it's, it's, it's another skew. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's, it's even though you have a Sonoma Coast and a 750 and a Sonoma Coast and a, and a, and a 375, they're two different SKUs. And if you have a distributor, it's, you know, it's a, it's just, it's a pain. Right. So real quick, I mean, I don't know that we really got into this, but just tell me how the, the, the relationship with Emerald evolved. I mean, Emerald is cool, cool guy. <laughs> Yeah, we we met. Remember when Wine Spectator, the the uh, the the big event was in San Francisco that one year? Yeah, about fifteen years ago, maybe something like that. Anyway, um, that's where we met there, and we do have common. I I know his. I know Alden's cousin, for example, out in Destin. So just a whole bunch of things came together, and then uh, Emerald invited us. He started the um, Legacy Foundation around that time, and his first event was twelve or thirteen years ago. Invited us out. And uh, since then, we're just great friends. In fact, I'm on his board now for the Legacy Foundation. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, didn't get to go out to our meeting in May in New Orleans. But. Well, how are they doing like charity events now and stuff like that? What's, what's the future of that? I mean, do you- Virtual, do you virtual. Okay. Yeah. And our, our, our next one is October. I think it's the 17th, I want to say. Um, and that's the, that would normally be the big one that we have in New Orleans. But unfortunately, we can't- uh, can't do anything and that's a big event. So um, we're just gonna kind of do some um, localized um, uh, wine dinners throughout the country. Okay. 
Yeah. Yeah. I did. So. I did a wine dinner last week. The, the first one I've done since, I, I mean, it's just unheard of. I did one at Ojai Valley Inn and Spa. It's the first one I've done in six months. I mean, who, who in the world would have thought hmm, that? I know. I'm getting a little tired, you know. I, I really do want to get out and, and do some stuff. And yeah, even, even get on a plane, which I always bitched about. Yeah, I'd, I would love to get on a plane right now, but I'm not going to. I, I had 25 people show up at the dinner at Ojai Valley Inn Spa. I've got a dinner in Vegas on Thursday night. Oh, no, sorry, Saturday night coming up this, this coming weekend. Um, and it's close to sold out at 40. And I mean, but it's a room that holds 100. Oh, good. Yeah, good. So, but it's that kind of thing. And it's just weird. I was kind of rusty. Oddly enough, I, I do, you know, we've done enough of this stuff. And I was like, I'm not doing particularly great right off the bat. But then like two thirds of the way in, I'm like, okay, I got it. This is fine. It, well, the good thing, the good news about that is like, it's fresh. It was. Yeah. Yeah. Come so, on. you know, that, that would be my biggest complaint about wine maker dinners is you, you sometimes run out of stories, you know, if you do too many of them, yeah. you know, if you're doing once at one a week. So I try not to not do them once a week. I'd, I'd rather keep everything fresh, but um, but yeah, it'll be good to get back out there. Yeah, it, it is. All right, so real quick, I mean, people, I think we're kind of getting near the end here, folks. So ask any other questions you might have, but what are we looking forward to with Alden Ali? So right now people can go online, they can sign up, they can buy wine. It's all cool. You got a little bit of rosé left, a little bit of shard left. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, actually, the shard and the, the Pinot Noir is going to be released in a couple of weeks. Okay. Uh, our, our, our 17 shard and the 19, 17 Sonoma Coast Pinot Noir and the 19 Chardonnay is going to be released in, in a couple of weeks. So I, just if, if people just want to sign up on, on the online and um, it's at uh, aldenalley.com. Yeah. And, and they get to become part of the list and you're going to be in touch with them and hang out. And, um, right? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 It's, it's a cool thing. So then, and can they get the Zen now? To, Cause I, 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 you know, I got to beg you for a bottle or two of Zen too. I know what, well, you know, what, what I, it's like half of it. We put the sale and then, and then the other half goes into my cellar. Okay. But I, cause I know, drink it all. You know, I love Jake Zen and, and that, yeah. The, the fruit from there and all of that is is a pretty fantastic fantastic source so yeah no it's good i i um if if people want to send us a um a uh, email to our info inbox um inquiring about the zinfandel if people are really serious i think i've got like 15 cases left of the 17. Oh, so. and then you'll have the 18 at some point in the spring okay yeah yeah um, and I imagine 18 at that spot in Russian River was a really, really good year, too. Really good. Really good. 18s are killing it across the boards and the 19s, for that matter. Uh, my 19, it's interesting, my 19 Clarices, and at some point I want you to try them, but um, mine are a little more tannic, and I just tried them right after bottling, but they've got some backbone to them. They're, they're interesting. 18s are one of those years which was a long, cool growing season. They seem to be like they taste good early, but then they taste good. I think they're going to age well. I mean, it's one of yeah. those. I, the nineteens are going to be an interesting, interesting vintage. Well, I hate to get into the weeds too much about that, but did you lower your uh, whole cluster on that? I did. I took it between seventeen and uh, eighteen. It's like two thirds. Yeah. Okay. So like it you was said, man, you got you got to follow what Mother Nature gives you. You do, honestly. The 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 this is not. We're not like making Coca Cola. No, exactly. Why Coca Cola failed in the wine business? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. They really did. They owned Sterling for a little bit. And yeah, they, exactly. Way back they, then, they completely screwed that up. You know, it's funny. I remember that stuff, and you remember that stuff because we're old. <laughs> it's what? Like, what? No, I could grow my hair out if I wanted to. Oh yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> I could dye mine brown again too. But let's yeah. face it. <laughs> not really going to happen so um anyhow well dan this has been fantastic i really appreciate uh everybody showing up and hanging out i'm going to unmute everybody guys grab a glass of whatever you're drinking let's do a cheers for everyone and 
Thank you all for being here. Appreciate it. Unmute yourself. I think you guys got to do it your own. But Cheers. Thank Cheers. you for, for being here. Thank you. Cheers. 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 Everybody. Cheers. 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 Thank you, everybody. Adam, um, thank you very much for including me in this. This is so much fun. And thank you, everyone, for uh, hanging out on a Monday. Yeah, thank you. Dan. Love thank you. you. Always have. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Dan. Bye, oh, guys. Bye. Bye. Thank, you. thank you, Diana. Yes. <laughs> Thanks for letting me have some of the wine. <laughs> well, of course. Mm -hmm. So this was, I got, I got the Sonoma Coast.